Standing as we are on the precipice of next month's Iowa caucus, you'd think that the good people of Iowa and New Hampshire would be drowning in political advertising. Yet, in comparison with 2007 at least, their airwaves are eerily quiet. Earlier this week, the New York Times reported that for a variety of reasons, including the fact that just Republicans are competing in this year's primaries, ad buys are down in those states way down. Campaigns and political groups spent almost $22 million in Iowa by this point in 2007. This year, they've spent only $2.4 million. Instead, it seems free media have filled the void. First among them, the televised debate. Welcome to the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando, Florida, the site of our Republican presidential debate. Speaker Gingrich, this next one's for you. You've criticized extending unemployment benefits, uh, saying that you are, quote, opposed to giving people money for doing nothing. Benefits have already been extended. The idea that you stand here before us and talk about that you're strong on immigration is on its face the height of hypocrisy. The governor says, look, states ought to be able to opt out of Social Security. Our, our nominee has to be someone who, who isn't committed to abolishing Social Security, but who's about, committed to, to saving Social Security. How we have always had at the heart of our party. Uh, I don't think he knows what he's talking about uh, in, that, in that regard. Kathleen Hall Jamison, a professor and longtime analyst of political media, says you should consume your debates. They're good for you. When a good reporter does an extended interview with a candidate, you don't simply learn what the candidate wants to tell you. You learn what the candidate tells you after being confronted with tough questions. Well, the candidates are relentlessly on message. They turn every question, no matter what the topic, back into their set of talking points. What you learn about Governor Perry when, for an entire debate, he kept moving back to energy policy, no matter what he was asked, was that he may not have the range of expertise required to answer those questions yet. What you learn when the candidates on the Republican stage are asked, would you take 10 times spending cuts to one times tax increase, and they say no, you know the position of the entire Republican field and how it differs from the Obama administration. You know across the debates that these candidates oppose the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which they call call Obamacare. You can't learn all of that in advertising. So do you see any value in political advertising? I mean, in terms of instructing the electorate? Yes, no question. Advertising in general contains accurate, not inaccurate statements. I'm surprised. That's historically true. And I tell you that having spent more hours than I would care to count analyzing claim by claim in the ads, but that doesn't mean that there aren't serious deceptions in them. That's why we need a lot of good journalism wrapped around this political process. It was interesting. The ratings for the early debates, at least, were pretty high. Were they higher than usual? We tend to have higher attention to politics when the nation feels anxious, also when they're unhappy with the incumbent. But the ratings have lagged. They tend to over time. But the fact that we had the early spike and that we have respectable ongoing levels is good news. Candidates focused, for example, in one debate solely on foreign policy, another debate solely on economic matters. Your level of knowledge about these candidates has risen substantially if you've paid even reasonable attention. You know, the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision has resulted in a Mount Everest of cash. What do you think led us to this moment where money is not dominating the media environment? The opportunity to participate in the debates early said to candidates, I can reach my intended audience without expending ad dollars. You would not have seen Speaker Gingrich emerge as a candidate or Mr. Kane emerge as a candidate. Both of those candidacies driven by debate performances. They weren't doing very much advertising. In fact, in Gingrich's case, he wasn't doing any. Well, these are glorious days for democracy. <laughs> well, let's just say better than some others. Doesn't it have something to do with the fact that there were so many GOP candidates that people were keeping their money off the table? No, we've had this number in fields before. Hmm. Um, I think what was accounting for it is the fact that you had the venues and they were attracting the audience. Are you expecting an explosion of advertising in the coming months? Yes. We're going to see so much advertising that you will turn on the golf channel and find ads. You'll turn on your channels that ordinarily would never see a political presence, and there they will be. Indeed, they're going to have to figure out how to put money into advertising on people's backs in order to spend all of their money. <laughs> 
You know, you talk a lot about interviews, but these are GOP candidates. And where we've seen the preponderance of interviews is on Fox News. Do you really think that the public is getting bang for that particular buck? This week, we saw extended interviews by Wolf Blitzer on CNN of Governor Perry and of Speaker Gingrich. Good, tough questions, very clear follow-up. Governor Perry's answers, for example, on Israel are going to create real controversy. Certainly, Brett Baer got into a tussle with Romney on Fox News. That was a good interview by Brett Baer. You also saw a very strong interview by Bill O'Reilly of Governor Perry the week that Governor Perry had put up an ad that took out of context a statement by President Obama. In the ad, Governor Perry says that President Obama says Americans are lazy. Bill O'Reilly said that wasn't what he's referring to, was it? Wasn't he referring to government agencies? He also asked him to defend his position that President Obama is a socialist. I think that we ought to be open to the possibility that Fox journalistic norms will hold Republican candidates accountable. And those of us who may not be inclined to watch Fox might be well served by watching those interviews. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Kathleen Hall Jameson is the head of the Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania and director of Fact Check and the new website, flackcheck.org. Jameson is not alone in detecting a new, tougher approach to GOP candidates from Fox News Channel. Gabriel Sherman, a contributing editor at New York Magazine, says the less kind, less gentle interviewing of Republican hopefuls is in part a marketing strategy conceived by Fox News chairman and CEO Roger Ailes. What Roger Ailes has successfully done is allowed this Republican primary to take place almost entirely on Fox News. The candidates show up in the morning on Fox and Friends. They do interviews during the day. They appear in the prime time at night. They've allowed candidates a platform to air their proposals, critics would say without scrutiny, but they've also knocked them around. For Fox News to move center, it first has to have been on the right. The daily marching orders from editorial management, uh, previously John Moody, now Bill Salmon, has been in lockstep with the messaging of uh, uh, the Republican National Committee. And these are marching orders not for the punditry, but for the new side of the organization. From my sources at the network, Bill Salmon's presence has been very controversial. And in fact, there's journalists inside Fox News who have been uncomfortable with Salmon's hands-on and unsubtle uh, attempts to steer coverage rightward. This gets to the heart of what the network is trying to do now. For a bit of context, it's really important to look at the fact that prior to the Obama election, Fox News's ratings were down considerably. And so, you know, Roger Ailes looked at the landscape in 2008 and said, what can I do to re-energize conservatives and increase ratings on my network? And he hired a whole stable of former Republican candidates and politicians. Those decisions created an environment where Fox News tapped into this populist fervor that was sweeping the country and ratings exploded. Fox News became a active participant in the storyline that was developing from 2008 through the 2010 midterms, that there was this populist, anti-government, anti-Obama movement sweeping the country. That achieved what Roger Ailes had wanted, which was to revive the network and dominate the cable news ratings race, which translates into roughly uh, about a billion dollars in profit annually. What changed his mind and made him drift, at least in the direction of the center? The short answer is Roger Ailes couldn't control Glenn Beck. In the opening months of the Obama presidency, Glenn Beck's ratings uh, exploded from roughly about a million to uh, over two million. Glenn Beck's no longer on the network. I think Ailes realized that Glenn Beck was becoming the public face of Fox News. He needed to remind both his audience and the rest of the media that Fox News was not Glenn Beck. So this uh, journalism offensive uh, has manifested itself recently in an interview with Republican Mitt Romney in which anchor Brett Baer on health care, having as a governor of Massachusetts instituted a health care program much like Fox boogeyman Obamacare. Do you still support the idea of a mandate? Do you believe that that was the right thing for Massachusetts? Do you think a mandate, mandating people to buy insurance, is the right tool? 
Uh, Brett, I don't know how many hundred times I've said this too. This is an unusual interview. <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Absolutely, what we did in Massachusetts was right for Massachusetts. I've said that time and time again. Brett Baer told Bill O'Reilly in a subsequent follow-up interview that Romney said he thought his questions were overly aggressive and uncalled for. Now, uh, it's also fascinating to see that Fox News, which is a very difficult institution to penetrate, allowed Howard Kurtz of Newsweek to uh, roam around and interview their producers at a debate in Orlando. And recently, at a Fox News forum in Manhattan, allowed Jim Rutenberg of the New York Times to roam around backstage. And uh, it was another embarrassing moment for the Romney campaign because they tried to shield Romney from uh, the Times reporter. So the front-runner Republican candidate goes into what he thinks is the Citadel and finds out that it is in no way a safe haven. What is Ailes up to? It's important to look at Fox News as a product packaged and sold every day to millions of people. Coming out of the 2010 midterms, Fox News realized that its product was potentially liable for the incendiary rhetoric that was making its way onto the channel and that they needed to rebrand themselves. That is why you are seeing the New York Times allowed to interview Republican primary candidates in a venue that no journalist would get access to. What can go wrong? A lot can go wrong. Fox faces uh, a risk if they push this idea that they are moving to the middle too far. They could alienate their conservative base that has been such a foundation of their rating success. Fantastic, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Sherman is a contributing editor for New York Magazine.